Brother Jack here. Christians need to walk a fine line in their relationship with the system. Although we should not cause problems, if we are sincere in following Jesus, problems will come our way. This happens when we're forced to make a decision between obeying God and obeying earthly laws. We need wisdom to work out how to walk this narrow path, especially since the issues are not always clear, but also due to where the world is heading with regard to the mark of the beast. Several people have written to us to tell us that it is not practical or possible to leave the system to serve God full time. And one of the reasons people give for this is to say that giving up everything and living by faith would lead them to do things or to live in such a way that it would be considered illegal. The majority of people's concerns has to do with some of the following issues. The need for a permanent and registered address in the system for refuge and bureaucracy. The need for a paid job for financial security and to satisfy the authorities that they are not doing anything wrong. And finally, a concern about the possible repercussions on behalf of the system if one does not comply with all they demand. We need to be sensitive to the difficulties that many people face when they consider Jesus' call to give up everything and live by faith especially in countries that have a lot of socialist-type policies, like Sweden and the Netherlands, where dropping out of the system can be seen as an act of aggression against an otherwise compassionate system. But this should not stop us from doing everything we can to expose the lie that it is impossible to leave the system. And this is especially important as we approach the fulfillment of the revelation and the mark of the beast, as I'll explain later in this video. To expose the lie, first we have to understand how it is propagated. One way is through false teaching. Churchgoers everywhere are taught isolated passages of scripture which are often misinterpreted. One example of this is Romans 13, 1 to 10. Here, Paul writes instructing Christians to be subject to higher powers, for there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God, this teaching has been used for centuries to justify Christians prostituting their time for money and in fighting wars sanctioned by governments and institutional churches, not to mention all the atrocities that have been committed in the name of God. The final result is that God has been used to justify a whole range of ungodly practices. The passage in Romans continues saying, for rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. This is the authority any legitimate government would have. However, after his resurrection, Jesus clarified that all authority had been given to him in heaven and on earth. This means that no earthly government has authority to go against the teachings of Jesus. Therefore, we must submit to the system to the degree to which the system is submitted to the supreme authority, God, through Jesus. When Jesus was about to be sentenced to death, Pilate said to him, Don't you know that I have authority to crucify you, and I have authority to release you? Jesus replied, You would not have any authority over me if it had not been given to you from above. Paul seems to be saying the same thing in his letter to the Romans, that is, that our submission must always be to God, which means that we will not fight with violence against earthly governments, but we will submit to them as far as our conscience will allow. This means we have to walk a thin line, where we do not compromise on what we believe, but neither do we fight politically or with violence against the system to try and overthrow it. The same as Jesus, who submitted to the authorities of his day. He refused to ask God to send him a legion of angels to protect him, and he refused to tell his followers to fight, because his kingdom is not of this world. That's how Jesus submitted to the authorities and yet never compromised spiritually with them. Can you see the difference? A general rule for Christians is that of obeying any earthly law 
that does not contradict God's law or go against our conscience or hinder us from fulfilling what God has commanded us. However, whenever earthly laws do contradict God's laws, our submission to the supreme authority of God will result in a just disobedience of the earthly law. In other words, we should not look for ways to rebel against the system. But, when we put God's laws above man's laws, rebellion against the system will be the natural result of our submission to God. A good example of this is found in Acts 5, 27-29. Here, Peter and the other apostles were brought before the Sanhedrin and questioned by the high priest. The high priest told the apostles that they had been given strict orders not to teach in Jesus' name. But in response, Peter and the other apostles said, We must obey God rather than man. The Sanhedrin had commanded them not to preach about Jesus. But Jesus had commanded them to go into all the world, teaching people to obey everything Jesus had commanded. So from the apostles' perspective, the choice was clear. Put God above men. And this same choice should be clear for anyone who claims to be a follower of Christ today. In all situations, we must accept the supreme authority of God over our lives and over the system itself. This includes accepting any punishment that the earthly authorities give as a result of our disobedience to their laws, as Jesus did when he submitted to the punishment of Pilate, and as Peter and the other apostles did when they submitted themselves to be punished by the Sanhedrin. They did not protest to being whipped. Rather, they rejoiced for having been given the honour of suffering for their obedience to God. So the first line on which Christians are called to walk is learning to disobey and submit to the system at the same time. As the system gets progressively more satanic and closer to the fulfilment of the Mark of the Beast prophecy, we will have to disobey more of what the system commands us at the same time that we will submit to whatever the system dishes out to us as a result of that disobedience. Another passage that is used to justify conformity to the system is found in Matthew 22, 15 to 22. Here, some of the Pharisees conspire to trap Jesus in his words. They ask Jesus if it is lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not. Jesus initially responds asking them why they are testing him and calling them hypocrites. Then he asks them to show him some money and they bring him a coin. Jesus asks whose image and inscription is on the coin, to which they reply, Caesar's. The answer Jesus gives them leaves everyone speechless and confused. He says, therefore, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and give to God what belongs to God. Now, why did Jesus refuse to give them a clear answer? Surely, if he believed it was lawful to demand and pay the tax, he would have given a clear yes to the question, affirming that we should pay it. But Jesus responded in such a way that depending on how we interpret this teaching, it will be revealed where our faith is placed, whether in God or the system. Most churches and systemites only choose to see the first half of the teaching, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and they interpret it to mean that we must give our time and money to the system first and then give God the leftovers. In contrast, true followers of Jesus know that God requires all our heart, soul, mind and strength. True, if someone works for money in Caesar's system, then they clearly have a duty to give Caesar his dues. But for those of us who respond to Jesus' call to forsake all that we have, to sell our possessions and give to the poor, and dedicate ourselves full-time to work for God and not for money, then how much is left to give to Caesar after we have fulfilled what Jesus has commanded? Now, if we owe Caesar taxes, then we should pay them. But we should never use that as a justification to keep serving Caesar in his system instead of serving God. So while we must make an effort to live in peace with the system and not rebel with violence or politically against it, our first priority should always be with God. We have been freed from having to be slaves to the system for money so that we can now dedicate ourselves completely to the kingdom of God. And if the system wants to persecute us for this, 
then that is part of the cross we have to bear. Another way that the system promotes the lie that it is impossible to leave the system is through our own interest. For example, if the system says that we cannot register a vehicle or have access to welfare or medical insurance without a secular job or without a permanent address, we have to make a choice. We can choose to argue that we cannot live without these things or we can choose to accept the consequences of living without them. True, living without them can be uncomfortable and result in inconveniences, but that does not make it impossible. Can you see how our attachment to these commodities can blind us to what is possible? All things are possible. All things that God asks us to do. A third way that the lie is propagated is due to a lack of faith in the solution. Men and women of faith in past times have put God above the systems of their day. These pilgrims have lived without a fixed address, seeking refuge in distant lands. They have lived without paid jobs or vehicles to travel in. They have done it without access to welfare programs, medical insurance and various forms of identification. So even though the system is always making it more difficult to leave it, the fact that other people have managed it, which includes people who are doing it even now, is evidence that it is possible. The issue is not whether it is possible to leave the system. The issue is whether we are willing to leave the system and to face the consequences as a result of putting our faith in something superior to what the system has to offer. If you really want to learn more about how to live outside the values of the system, watch our video, How to Survive Without the Mark of the Beast, where I share some tips on how to do that. This decision about who we are going to follow is not going to be easier in the future. The more anti-Christian the system becomes, the more difficult it will be to function outside of it. In some places, it is already illegal to help the poor or to preach the gospel as Jesus commanded us to do. As the system becomes stronger and more controlling, it will be more difficult to get off the system conveyor belt. It is probable that we'll be told with more frequency and volume, you need this or that to function in society, whether it be a physical address or a microchip to buy and sell. This issue of the mark of the beast, which is the dominant theme of this channel, has eternal significance, and still very few people seem to be willing to make changes in their lives that are consistent with that reality. The choice is ours. We can accept the shame of being labelled illegals, or we can end up supporting a system that is illegal in God's eyes. We need to ask ourselves sincerely if we love Jesus more than anything else, more than the commodities that the system offers us, more than our own lives. Are we willing to be seen as an embarrassment by our friends and relatives? Are we willing to be seen as illegal for the cause of Christ?